recall that if a sequence converges in uh, in the limit at infinity, that would mean that for all epsilon greater than zero, there is a capital N such that if N is larger than, if little n is bigger than capital N, then the sequence, the term in the sequence from the limit must be smaller than epsilon. So really what this is saying is that if there is a limit, then from some point on, all of the terms of the sequence have to be pretty close to that limit. Really, really close. How close? With an epsilon. So what would it mean for something to not converge, to diverge? Well, the negation of this statement up here, since it's universal, would be an existential statement. So we'd have to show that there is an epsilon greater than zero, such that for all n, if we had n, or there is an n epsilon greater than zero, such that for all n, that this statement right here would have to be false. For what would it mean for that? So what would it mean for that statement there to be false? Well, that would mean that we would have to have the antecedent be, be true. So for all n, there is a case for all n where n is bigger than capital N, and simultaneously we have S n minus L being bigger than or equal to epsilon. Right, and all we have to do is find an epsilon that makes this the case. So effectively, let's look at this as an example first. S n, the sequence S n equals negative 1 to the power of n. So if we start to replace values in here, we can see that S 1 would be what we get when we plug in 1. So we would have negative 1. S 2 would be negative 1 squared. S 3 would be negative 1, because it's negative 1 cubed. S n S4 would be negative 1 to the 4th, which would be 1, etc, etc, etc. So this does not appear to be converging to some limit because it's oscillating or jumping between negative 1 and 1. Notice how far is negative 1 from 1? Well, that's 2 units, right? Negative 1 to 1 is a distance of 2 units. So when I set up my problem here, when I try to set up my uh, my proof that this diverges, I just really need to pick a number that's less than 2 because I know that I can always bounce between these two different values. So for my proof of divergence here, for my proof of divergence, let's start off with saying let epsilon be something less than 2. Technically doesn't really matter to me. I'll just take the number 1. So now consider what will happen in the next case. So we know that there's a statement that is true, or we want to show something's true for all capital N. So let's suppose that capital N is given. Okay. Now notice that both N plus 1 and N plus 2 are greater than n, of course, one more and two more. Well then, what would happen if we look at s sub n plus 1 and s sub n plus 2? Well notice that the distance between those two terms, since n plus 1 is some value, uh, that means that this would be negative 1 to the value of n plus 1 minus negative 1 to the value of n plus 2 and I don't know technically which one of these would be negative 1 and which one would be 1, but since they are consecutive, we know that one of them is 1 and one of them is negative 1. So how far apart are they from each other? They must be, this number is always going to be 2, right? Always going to be 2. And 2 is certainly bigger than or equal to 1, and 1 was our epsilon. So you can see I could have chosen any number that was smaller than 2, and it would have worked for this argument, showing that negative 1 diverges. So this diverges. So why don't you take a moment and try this next one on your own. Tn equals cosine of n pi thirds. So assuming you pause the video and tried this for a moment on your own, I'm going to try to convince you that this diverges. So if we let n equal 1, let's see, cosine of pi over 3 is, that would be 1 half.
cosine of 2 pi over 3, negative 1 half. Cosine of 3 pi over 3 would be negative 1. And then we come back through the bottom half of the circle. So that would be negative 1 half. And then over into quadrant 4 is 1 half. And then 1. And then technically we cycle around here. So this is going to keep going around the circle all the way around. So again, this doesn't appear to converge either. It seems to be flipping out on us. So just for convenience's sake, I know that this is going to keep cycling around. So I'm going to concentrate on these values right here of negative 1 and 1, which happen on every third term. Third term is negative 1. The sixth term is 1. The ninth term will be negative 1. And watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the exact same type of idea because I know it's going to bounce around. So let epsilon equal 1. There is our epsilon. Suppose we have a general n. Suppose capital N is given. Okay, now that we've done that, note, let k be a multiple of 3 greater than n. Right? There's lots of multiples of 3 that are bigger than capital N. So just let k be any one of those. So I'm already forcing myself to be either negative 1 or 1 if I look at t sub k. Okay, so what are we going to look at now? Notice, let's take it and go with it. t k, which I don't know which one it is, right? It's either negative 1 or 1, but t k plus 3. 3 is the next multiple of 3. So it's the other one of either negative 1 or 1. So if one of these is 1 and one of them is negative 1, what's the distance between them? Well, that's going to be 2. And 2 is bigger than 1, which is our epsilon. So this proves that, well, technically, to be very precise here, I'm not actually showing that it's compared to some limit, because no limit exists. So what I'm showing is that there are terms that are always going to be farther than epsilon apart for epsilon equals 1. So there's no possibility of this sequence converging to some fixed value.